we're going to have a little chat here today about some of the changes amongst the DEF CON groups uh, and some ideas about hack spaces, uh, inner hack space communication and extra hack space communication. Um, on our panel uh, we have Nick Farr, uh, Dave Marcus, uh, and Anarchy Angel. Um, uh, and I let them go through and Come on, shots. Yeah, yeah. Shots. shot, shot, Come shot. Come on. Five hour energy shots. Come on. Wake up, people. Let's go. I know most of you are still in here because you fell asleep in the EFF's talk. So if you're just waking up, um, we're going to uh, talk first about the DEF CON groups uh, point items. I just became the DEF CON groups coordinator about a month ago. Um, we have some very inter uh, interesting changes coming along. Yeah, right. Black needs a beer. Who's got a beer? Yes, who has a beer? Anybody have a cold beer? No. Bring Black a beer. Bring it here. I'll take it. Um, excuse my voice. I've been yelling at humans all day. Um, <clears throat> so with DEF CON groups, we've had some interesting things. Domestically, everything's pretty solid. You know, we have a pretty good infrastructure. Uh, Yeah, um, we have uh, some, you know, domestically we, we have a pretty solid infrastructure. People kind of get it. Better treasure they understand what DEF CON groups ever. are. Uh, internationally, we've had some issues. <laughs> um, just to get a few things out of the way, you cannot be DEF CON of a country. So, no DEF CON of India. Uh, you can't copy the DEF CON.org website and then start your own up and start charging admission. Uh, I mean, it's kind of crazy that I have to be saying these things, but it's true. I'm talking to pretty much all DEF CON groups in India. Uh, <laughs> on that note, um, it's a privilege to be a DEF CON group um, and, you know, treat it respectfully. So, uh, with that, I'm going to go through and uh, let everybody tell you a little bit about themselves. Nick? No. Uh, thank you, Black Days. I'm Nick Farr. Uh, most people know me for my work with hackerspaces back in 2007, uh, back at the DEF CON way back then we organized a trip bringing people from DEF CON to the CCC camp in Germany uh, where we showed people like Brie Pettis and Elliot and um, David Holden, a lot of people who went back to the United States and started hackerspaces um, based on the German model um, that was going on over there. And uh, since 2007, there's been an explosion of hackerspaces in the United States, um, and now uh, fucked up every single one of them. And and <laughs> Dave has his own opinions on that, uh, and so that's why I, I'm happy to sort of present just a very brief overview of uh, what's been going on since, and some of the and discussing a lot of the things that have been happening since 2007. Dave, sir, I'm Dave Marcus. I'm known mainly for being Dave Marcus. Um, doesn't really require a whole lot of other explanation. I'm the, my day job is being the director of advanced research and threat intelligence for McAfee. Um, but with uh, Nick, I helped start a hackerspace in Maryland called Unallocated Space. So I'm, I'm happy to share my horrendous, horrible experiences uh, of, of doing that and working at a disgustingly close uh, relationship with Nick, who is a really tedious, tedious human being to work with. Um, so there you go. I am uh, <clears throat> Mike Guthrie, also known as Anch. Um, I run, I'm the coordinator for DC 503 in Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm also a member of the hackerspace Brain Silo in Portland, Oregon. And um, I'm calling bullshit. On Why not? Oh, on yourself. Uh, I'm Adam Espedia, also known as Anarchy Angel, and um, I run uh, DC 414, which is a Milwaukee chapter of uh, DEF CON, and um, uh, I hack shit. Fair assessment. <laughs> so um, Nick has a little presentation about uh, just in general um, hack spaces. And Have fun. Yeah, tell me about Renderman's talk, what, like what happens here. I, I don't do the bullshit on that source. You are the bullshit on that. Of course. 
Dude, we, should we should we should we should be getting like stock options, right? And they should. Look. Why is everyone? People just asleep. Yeah. What? Yeah, the, the the people who didn't leave are probably the ones who passed out. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Can I get one of those? swapped over. Is there a function on the screen? Yeah, no, I mean the glitch on the screen. I okay. We'll show you the little detector with display. I've been running into other dorky stuff, so uh, I, I, I believe you, so. There you go. There you go. There, That's there you go. up. support to start our presentation on hack spaces. Hey, I did, I did. Right. They didn't do All shit. Right, we about ready? All right, guys, what's up? Uh, my name is Black Days. Uh, I'm the DEF CON Group's coordinator for DEF CON.org. Um, we're going to have a little chat here today about some of the changes amongst the DEF CON groups uh, and some ideas about hack spaces, uh, inner hack space communication, and extra hack space communication. Um, on our panel, uh, we have Nick Farr, uh, Dave Marcus, uh, and Anarchy Angel. Um, uh, and then let them go through and come on shots. Yeah, yeah. shot, shot, come shot. Come on. on. Five hour energy shots. Come on. Wake up, people. Let's go. I know most of you are still in here because you fell asleep in the EFFs talk. So if you're just waking up, um, and uh, with that, 
Yeah, I think uh, alluding to what Dave was talking about, um, I, I've been involved in two hacker spaces um, that are, that took a little while to get going and one of which is currently in a struggling phase. Um, and so I wanted to instead sort of focus on the negative, I wanted to focus on the positive and look at what an ideal hack, hacker space looks like. Um, but before that, if, if I may be allowed to do so, um, I'd like to plug my Kickstarter. Some of you might remember uh, a couple of DEF CONs ago, I ate a 20 patty in and out burger as a fundraiser for the Hacker Foundation. And now that I have a Kickstarter that's in process, I said I will repeat what I did several DEF CONs ago if Sierra Zulu makes its $50,000 funding goal by 10 p.m. tonight. Uh, that's the URL, uh, the URL. Is so if it gets funded by 10 p.m. tonight, I will eat a 20 patty burger at the Ninja Networks party, which uh, will probably get blogged and tweeted and you can see it or join in there. And for every additional K above 50 that gets funded, I'll eat one additional patty. 20, a stack of 20 patties. A stack of 20 patties. You yeah. You, you could say that, yeah. You'll eat, your, you'll eat a Nick Farr's worth of patties. There you go. That's disgusting. I know. Just like you, Mr. Dave. That's disgusting. Uh, but getting back to the point, um, I wanted to, fo again, focus on the positive. What does an ideal hackerspace look like? But to start off with, uh, a lot of people get hung up on what the definition of a hackerspace is and I have a very, very simple definition. It is simply a physical space where hackers gather to hack things together. Not that complicated. Hackerspaces go by many, many other different names. Um, but whatever you decide to call it, if it fits that definition, I'd call it a hackerspace. Ideally, the first thing that should come to your mind when you think about a hackerspace is a really awesome group of people who are dedicated to hacking and making things and bringing in more people to help them hack and make things. A lot of building that community is focusing primarily on teaching, learning, and hacking. It, there should be a constant intellectual simulation going on inside of a hackerspace that's fun. Hacking in large part is about play and about discovery. And as a process of that, hackerspaces should always be coming up with new and cool projects. It doesn't matter if it's something that gets boing boing right away, but if it's something that's cool to you and your community and it's new and it's something that hasn't been seen before and it could or does inspire the larger hacker community in some way, that's the kind of thing those three things together, people, teaching, learning, and hacking, and coming up with cool projects are what I believe an ideal hackerspace is all about. Hackerspaces are nothing new. How many people here are, have been involved actively in a hackerspace? Okay, and then keep your hands up. How many people have attended a hackerspace at least once? Keep your hands up. Okay, now everybody lower your hands. How many people have never been in, driven past, or have access to a hackerspace? Okay, so a, a minority of the crowd, most people, that those answers get better and better every single DEF CON. Um, but there are hundreds of hackerspaces just in the United States. There's almost a thousand throughout the entire world right now. And I wanted to go over some of the traps that I think a lot of hackerspaces fall into. Um, hackerspaces that are really successful, that are great at building a community, teaching, learning, and hacking, and coming up with cool projects you all know about. They're out there. They're constantly in the blogosphere. A lot of them make mainstream media. And what I really wanted to look at were the six sort of common traps that I think a lot of people who get involved in the community and get out there and start a hackerspace tend to fall into. The first trap, um, and I'm talking a lot of personal experience here, what happened in my most recent hackerspace, an allocated space in Severn, Maryland, is the thought that, you know, we don't do that here. You know, I don't believe in that at all. Real hackers can hack on anything. It doesn't really matter what it is. And ideally, your hackerspace will be looking at things that are beyond your comfort zone. If you're mostly IT people, you'll get into hardware. If you're mostly hardware people, you'll get into the more of the infosec and the coding, things like that, because it's outside your comfort zone. It's something that you want to find out more about. Second really big common trap is the hackerspace. You have all the tools, you have all the equipment, but it kind of just becomes some place that you hang out at after work, party, drink, play games, this sort of a thing, yada, yada, yada. That's all cool. That's, that's a great socializing and having a social space where people feel welcome to come into is an awesome thing, but it should be secondary to the, con to the things that you should be hacking on and working on actively in a hackerspace. Third trap that a lot of hackerspaces fall into, some people call this the founder's curse, are, is the leader with a vision trap. 
you have one really strong personality and everything that happens in the hackerspace sort of lives and dies by the opinions and the whims and what other people perceive that personality to like or dislike at any one given time. Get rid of that. That's a really harmful trap in any kind of an organization that you're in. Successful organizations follow ideas and energy and passion. They don't follow people. And successful organizations welcome all sorts of different ideas, projects, and are always bringing in new people and new ideas and breeding off of that enthusiasm that comes uh, w when you have constant, a constant supply of new and excited and talented and passionate people coming in the door. Again, single point of failure is the next big trap that a lot of hackerspaces fall into where maybe it's not something where you have a bottleneck at the leader but in various different administration, administrative functions in your hackerspace or there's one person that always does that one thing. Just like in real life where you should have backups for everything and start eliminating single points of failure everywhere in your process, you should have backups for your key leaders and admins. One of the really big things, one of the first things they teach you in whatever kind of leadership class you're looking at is that the best leaders start training their replacement immediately because that lets those leaders get up to the next level of whatever organization or, uh, or movement or whatever it is that they're doing. They know that they can, one, disappear. You know, things happen to people. Accidents happen. People get burnt out. Everybody that's in a critical position, no matter what it is, if it's a critical project your hackerspace does, if it's the treasurer, if it's the person that's responsible for scheduling things, no matter what it is, if it's a critical function, that person should be finding and training their replacement right away. And then um, the second to last trap that a lot of hackerspaces fall into is what I call the Tasmanian devil trap. Some people refer to this as drama, some people refer to this um, as interpersonal conflicts, but regardless of all of that, if you're not learning, teaching, hacking, working on something or figuring out what you're supposed to be working on, you probably shouldn't be in the hackerspace. So much energy gets burned up on everybody in the space discussing one particular personality who's creating a roadblock to teaching, learning and hacking in a hackerspace. It's very simple. If it's clear that, that, that a person or a thing or whatever is not contributing to the hacking in a hackerspace, they should leave or they should be asked to leave. And then the final problem which like anything in life is always a problem, how do you manage your resources? So many people try to solve a money problem by thinking about different schemes or things that they could do to raise money or different ideas and that, that's the wrong focus. If you are having money problems, you should be thinking about how you can bring in more people, new ideas by doing different classes, events, working on cool hacks. If you bring people to your hackerspace, your money problems will disappear. And then that's the brief presentation that I wanted to give on my ideas this year at DEF CON. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, I just want to kind of get some uh, opinions uh, first from our panel members here, and then I'm going to ask uh, for some questions from the audience if you have them. Uh, Anch, any type of uh, tips or successes that you've come across? Any little pitfalls, or uh, but not just like, not just negative. Like, uh, what's like some pro tips as far as uh, going for a positive movement? Well, uh, hackers are inherently lazy. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm really trying to, to build the, uh, the DC 503 group and we have some momentum and then we, we have some non-momentum. Um, and so you kind of have to get people motivated to want to do stuff. Um, and some of that is projects and some of that is, is just being somebody that's, that's an active personality and, and some of it is me and some of it is not. You know, I get busy and I have a full-time job my boss is sitting in the audience right now looking at me, you know, giving me the, the evil eye, you should be working. Um, but, uh, you know, I have a full-time job and, and yeah, we get busy and we, we don't schedule meetings or I miss a meeting and the next meeting I show up to, people aren't there or, you know, it just kind of happens. But, um, so, you, you know, being consistent is, uh, becoming consistent is, is something that, that you know, as a, as a hacker space or even as a group, it needs to happen. I mean, if uh, the, the space that I'm in is actually pretty cool, they meet every Thursday. I mean, they have open house every Thursday. We have um, uh, uh, exploit night every 
Wednesday night, you know, every other Wednesday night, something like that. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, but being really consistent and understanding that people are people and people get busy is really important. Fair enough. Dave? Yeah, consistency. Um, one thing I think we kind of failed on from the beginning, and it's our own fault, is not having a lot of interesting classes that ran at a scheduled period monthly, right? So we, we would have weeks that were really, really active when we had a lot of people at the space, and then we have periods of time when it wasn't. Um, so by not having a consistent schedule of doing something on a Wednesday night every single week, something on a Thursday night every single week, um, there, it defaulted to the clubhouse environment very, very quickly. Um, so really having an idea of six or seven events to run monthly is really, really helpful. Um, whether it's a night dedicated to hardware, same night monthly or same night weekly. Those kinds of things do a lot to bring people in on a consistent basis. Um, and then pick, make sure you pick your space correctly where you physically locate it. Location, 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 right? Um, being located next to a school is a good thing. Um, being located in, in, in industrial areas are a good thing. Just because you get people who are kind of naturally hackery in certain ways or, or that are in a scholastic area, you get lots of interest from students. If your space is located in the wrong area, it, you could be behind the eight ball from the beginning. So location, consistency, and you know, like Nick had talked about before, the financial model is a real big deal too. We tried a very different financial model at Unallocated, didn't we Nick? You know, um, a key holder centric financial model where the key holders were responsible for, for the financial running of the space and everything was just donations. We had no membership or anything like that and it was a good idea for some things and a really problematic idea in, uh, in other areas. And you can't change your financial model in the middle of it either. Then you become the Netflix of hackerspaces, right? You change your financial model when you're not offering anything new. Everybody gets pissed off at you. Um, and if you don't have anything new to offer, you don't have anything new to offer. So, um. uh, Something else that's, that's I found is really important is having space for people to actually work. Uh, um, the, the space that I involve, I, I'm involved in right now, it, it becomes cluttered really, really fast. I mean, you get donations of hardware and, and you know, various pieces of stuff that people don't want, and and you have people that don't turn it away. You, you know? become their you become their drop point. Yeah, we had we had that same problem too. People would just drop CPUs off yeah. to us. Yeah, I, I, I'm not kidding you. I, I walked into this, this space one day and there's, there was a stack as tall as me of rack mount, rack mount PCs that yep. were worthless. And, it, and if, you're, if you're doing technology disposal, that's real cool if you're a, if you're a technology disposal place because then you can make money from the recovery of the circuit boards. And, but if you're not, what you are is somebody else's fucking warehouse. Yeah. Know? And, and that shit takes up space real damn quickly. And, and when you've got 800 CPU towers, and you don't have a project you're working it's true. on? true. I mean, DC-225, yeah. man, we have, we, I could create a Google worth yeah. of Beowulf clusters. I mean, <laughs> it's just, I mean, yeah. I have a metric shit ton of rats yeah. and rat-mounted servers. Yeah. If I get one more Dell 2860, I think... We have, we, have, we, we have a wall full of those huge CRT monitors and stuff like that, right? Yeah. And you don't want to turn it away because you, you may have a cool project you want to do with it. More often than not, it's going to be a big fucking wall of CRT monitors. You right. know, but if you make it into like an art project or something like that, it becomes interesting to do. But you don't have a lot of people that'll say, I'll take that big pile of hardware and turn it into an art project all There's the time. There's a reason right? corporations pay 20 grand to recycle a pile of crap. Or, or the, the, another thing that I, I kept saying and I, I never had time to do myself is if you've got a, a big pile of whatever it is, start taking it apart. Figure out how it works. You don't have to have a solid idea of what you want to do with it, but it's, it's junk. Too. Yeah, well, there, there you go. Smaller <laughs> piles is better than, you know. Smaller piles is better. It's smaller piles is better than bigger piles and you learn something by taking anything apart or just, just destroying it. <laughs> like how to get smaller piles of shit. Yeah, exactly. We had, we had tried to rip apart the CPUs into the circuit boards and then tried to attach all the circuit boards together and try to make art out of them and stuff like that. And you know, it's, it's one of those things where, go to your consistency thing, right? You know, it, it's a great project that everybody works on for four hours and then nobody ever works on it again. And then it never you know? gets cleaned up. And it never gets cleaned up. I, I'm of the considered opinion, a good hackerspace starts more projects than it ever finishes, right? Because it really should be about, you know, starting cool projects and stuff. So it's not important that they necessarily get finished, but don't leave a fucking mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 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 
the clean your shit up after you're done is really, really important. Well, we had a real problem with that too. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a real problem. And, you know, and that's where I think people get really pissed off at personalities. That's where your personality conflicts come in is, um, you know, you'll have some people who end up cleaning up the space more often than others. Clean, and that just causes resentment. It's like, don't let that fucker in anymore. He always leaves a mess. You know, or <laughs> such and such is drunk up in the loft again. Kick him out. You know, it's... The loft is an awesome project. You should talk about that. So, uh, Dude, that the loft, the loft, loft, loft is, is awesome. awesome. And Luckily for DC 414, we're um, still growing. We got maybe 20, 25 people. So, um, uh, back to consistency, um, I try to make every single meeting, um, no, matter, no matter what's going on, you know, I'll, I'll drop everything. But we also have it planned. You know, it's the first Friday of every month, and it's been that way for the last two or three years, I do believe. And um, so I mark that on my calendar ahead of time. My bosses know this is what I'm doing. And um, then back to one of his points was um, uh, don't make partying um, a priority. Um, well, we kind of do, um, but we don't do it at our meetings. We have two separate meetings. We have a technical meeting where we talk about you know, technical junk. And then we have another meeting where we just get drunk and shit-faced. Um, and we do that every month too, but that, the day for that is yeah. more fluid, you know. Whenever anyone can get ready to get drunk, um, we'll all pick out a day. Um, quite recently, though, That's we've been doing. Date. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> quite, quite recently, we've been doing um, uh, onto projects. Um, we've been using our, our social gathering, which is essentially what I call it, for uh, um, making a room in a haunted house so that, you know, it's. We go completely outside of the tech field a lot, we try. Um, and, uh, like, for instance, making a haunted house, you know, that's not something that. As far as I know, no other group is doing, um, which is kind of cool, I thought. Um, and <clears throat> other than that, you know, we just try to uh, have, have as much fun as we can um, and still uh, learn something. Um, at the meetings themselves, we um, don't usually take stuff apart or anything like that, but we try to have a presentation, a, a couple presentations at each meeting. Um, and the presentations, you know, um, reach from failing at web hacking um, to uh, making hyperponic bays for plants. And, um, plants. <laughs> I love plants. Yeah, the Northwest. To, uh, to lock picking, um, to, you know, modifying uh, uh, laptops and just, just all over the spectrum. We try to keep it all over the place because. Um, we have a couple of guys that are techies, we have a couple of guys that are, that are hardware freaks, and then we have a couple of guys that don't know anything about everything, but know a little bit about everything. Yep. You know? mm -hmm. So we, we try to keep the spectrum super, super open. Um, yep. And so far that's been successful to us. That's probably the key to our success. And that's one thing we didn't do enough of early on is we really focused on trying to build out technical stuff, right? Technical, 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 hacking, hacking, hacking. Without really realizing that, you know, you can run a carpentry class as a hacking class. Dance, exactly, you know? yeah. um, or you can have your laser cutter class or you can have your whatever. You know, you talk, it doesn't really matter what it is. It brings people in who share information and, and talk about things in a creative way. And it's all hacking when you get right down to it. Yep. But I, it, we didn't, I, I, as a founder, I, I just never considered that early on. It never occurred to me to teach, you know, carpentry at a hacker space, right? right? Yeah, you yeah. Know, and, and things like that, I think they all have their place, and fuck, you want to teach something, get up and teach a class. Well, plus, you know, it's great for us, because then we get to learn something yeah. that we knew absolutely nothing about. You know, I, I had no idea, you know, how, how to, how to lockpick until we had a lockpick come, guy come in and just school us all. And I had no idea how to make a hydroponic bay um, until somebody came in and showed me how to do it, you know. And it, it's great, you know, um, I, I get to teach people um, and I get to learn a whole bunch, uh, which is awesome, you know. It could, you couldn't ask for anything better than that, really. You, you brought up a really good point earlier, too. You, you, you slot time for fun. Yeah, definitely. You know, having fun is, is a super, yeah. super large importance about, you know, what we do. I mean, I do this. Work is not work for me. Work is fun. <laughs> you know, and hacking is fun, and so you, you know we. You need to make time for fun. I call bullshit on your job comment because your boss is in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I call bullshit on your job comment because your boss is in the audience. <laughs> hey, you guys need a set of these. I mean, oh, you, yeah. when he starts speaking, you guys can just. These are awesome. Great, right? <laughs> these are up these here these when we got great. here. They're, they're really awesome. <laughs> Yeah, um, we took the party thing I think a little bit too too too, too, too much of the limit when we first started on allocated because I, yeah, I don't think you have was, a ban on like liquor see, or there was there was a period of time I thought we were gonna die. Um, I just gotta say I gotta, we I gotta going, say on the ban on liquor Dude. we were going <laughs> through we were going through bottles 
of Jägermeister per night for a week at a time. Uh, I thought there was a period of time we were going to die. Um, and it set, it set the wrong out. tone for the space after a while. It turned a lot of people off, um, rightfully so. You know, we're a bunch of drunken idiots well, you know, for the first month and a half of the space. That set the tone of the space. Yeah, yeah. see, I don't know. See, at, at, at DC 55, yeah. we make it a point to get drunk weekly with one another. Yeah, it now, was hourly for us. Yeah, you know, we, we try to keep the whiskey out of the picture just because... Well, I mean, we like the stuff that we have working to still work after. Yeah. Our, our nickname, our tagline was we're a drinking space with a hacking problem. Hey. <laughs> and it was, it was well deserved because it was out of control. And, have, and again, I think it set the wrong tone for the space and it was hard to recover from that. I have to say your flame vortexes were fucking cool though. Yeah. We are the One of the, of <clears throat> the fire tornado. Of course, everybody can see that picture on my iPhone up here. <laughs> but that's what we're known for at Unallocated is fire tornadoes. Um, we've gotten 30, 40, 50 foot fire tornadoes. What? Yeah, oh, sorry. It's a giant flaming like tornado. tornado did. Anyway, that's what it is. I'll show you the video of it later if you want to see it. Every time we did a party toward the end, we would set up the fire tornadoes and they were absolutely amazing. One of the, uh, one of the points that uh, I, I personally came across um, as being an issue is too stringent of behaviors uh, being put on the people. Now, there, there are some liability issues that you do have to look out for as far as like property damage if you lease a space or something like that. But uh, too many restrictions kind of sets the tone of the group into a negative manner. Um, everybody has their own, you know, regulations internally that are necessary for the group to continue uh, having fun without, you know, catching a building on fire or yeah. catching someone else on fire. I found uh, that laser pointers are killers to DC groups. Yeah, I wonder how the 90 watt laser works across the room. I've heard this before. <laughs> yep. And uh, can you give a tattoo with one? That's uh, another one. So, <clears throat> but it, not, going, not going too far. Uh, are, you, are you speaking from personal experience? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so all, all those, all the, oh yes, very much so. Um, you can imagine the, the people I run with, they all have lasers and Let's just say, yes, you can give an awesome tattoo with a laser. <laughs> anyway. Yep. Um, the focus needs to be on, it, it, it can't be said enough, the focus needs to be on the projects and the hacking. That's um, right, no matter the, what it is. And the fun of it. it, it really is. If you focus on those kinds of things, you'll have a good hackerspace, but it's remarkably easy to have a screwed up hackerspace. It, it's, it's remarkably difficult to have a functioning <laughs> hackerspace. You, you would think they're completely different. Well, but, one but of the things that I've not, seen it's easier, is... Uh, it's easier to screw it up. The functioning spaces tend to get together more. Like uh, the, what the functioning spaces, for instance, inner space communication. Um, I know that there's been some headway with other groups as far as getting uh, VPNs connected, yep. dark nets connected. Chaos. To pull yeah, yeah, chaos, chaos VPN. VPN and stuff. Yep. Um, and we'll talk about that and kind of give them an overview of that here in a second. But the idea kind of behind what, what we're working towards is to pull resources that one group has with the sort of a scheduling and job system to get pieces, let's say machined, that you don't have something to print that piece. Uh, you can schedule it with another group, pay for the substrate, and have it shipped to you. Um, if you take a look at the Red Bull creation that 23B just did, you know, there were labs sending all sorts of cool ass pieces. And, you know, they put in, a, I think, a Null Space Labs sent a bunch of stepper motors via airmail. And uh, just in the middle of it, you saw sort of this project come together um, in a 72 hour space. And other groups were the ones who supplied uh, a lot of the parts, I wouldn't say uh, the predominance, but I mean, there was a whole lot of uh, inner group, uh, you know, communication and inner group sharing of resources that came together and, and really benefited the groups more so uh, than they were individually. And that's kind of what we're trying to do is get groups provisioned uh, who are active and functioning. Um, so, with that, I'll let you explain sort of what the Chaos VPN is. Dave? Oh, me. Yes, the Chaos VPN is kind of what it sounds like. It's a VPN um, run out of Germany, right, Nick? The, the admins are out of Germany. Humber. 
Sorry? Hamburg. Hamburg, out of Hamburg, Germany, and um, it's, it's a simple setup depending upon the box or the router that you're running, and it essentially connects you to hackerspaces worldwide, and, and even other hackers individually worldwide. Setups are, are relatively easy. You can share whatever resources on the Chaos VPN that you want. At Unallocated, we had shared our Minecraft server, our wiki, and we were even looking at sharing out um, our VM farm, actually, to, to be used for remote pen testing and, and stuff like that, and there's a whole list of the Chaos uh, VPN wiki that says this is which hackerspace is connected and these are the resources that they actually share out. So if you're looking to do Jabber or you're looking to do open Quake tournaments or something like that, you can hop onto the Chaos VPN and do it or you can get on the communal bulletin board or the communal wiki and say I have this, these resources I'm willing to share, you have these resources you're willing to share. And it's one of the underused uh, technologies I think there are. I think there's something to be said for you know hackers interconnected and yeah. hackerspaces <laughs> interconnected. Yeah, that's a, a pretty big, uh, like a pretty big focal point going forward. At least from my perspective, yep. being a coordinator, is getting resources for people to share. So, just kind of look in the next coming months for your DuffCon groups. There's going to be a dark net that's going to come up, sort of an unofficial uh, inner group dark net uh, that's actually been in the work between a few spaces uh, in the south. Um, I'm based out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and. Um, you know, we happen to have a whole bunch of hardware that was given to us, and so we've been kind of setting it up. Uh, we we have a VM farm. Um, we have an elastic computing environment, uh, so other people could spin up things. But the idea is just behind it all, connecting. And um, I don't know. I think uh, Anarchy Angel uh, and the groups in the Northwest. Um, I don't know how well, but I know regionally the DefCon groups do communicate together quite a bit. Um, well, well um, yeah, we uh, really don't communicate with a whole lot of other groups. We, we subscribe to their mailing lists and, and, and whatnot, but I, I don't know, I, I guess we're small fries to most of them. Um, they, uh, at least um, the Chicago one, um, they are not, uh, which is really the only uh, one in our area. Um, I, I've, I've talked to many people that want to start one, but um, like he said, hackers are generally lazy. And when I say, you know, oh, we'll start a hacker group, they're like, oh, fuck that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. True. Um, so, yeah, um, the only other major group in our area would be Chicago, and um, we just haven't uh, had too much success in communicating with them. Um, but that's probably mostly my fault because I haven't really tried. Uh, Fair enough. I mean, but the idea is to get a forum in an area where those groups can easily communicate with one another. Uh, also, DEF CON forums is a great place to find other people in your area. Um, I mean, there's a whole section for it. Yep. Uh, but just to provide those resources is kind of where we're headed because it is an isolated sort of cell uh, arrangement where people don't step out, they don't drive two hours to go meet people, yep. uh, but they also don't use technology for you know telepresence uh, to help kind of get people together and uh, a little bit more of that um, going forward. An easy to use resource is kind of what we want to offer. Um, and with that, I think you have anything else to add, Nick? Uh, should take questions. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what I was about to say. Uh, with that, if, if anybody wants to walk up, there's a microphone right here. Um, we got, you know, what, 20 minutes? Um, step up, ask any questions. One guy. I like this guy. How's it going, guys? Um, this is really cool because uh, um, I'm from laboratoryb.org. Um, we're out of Burlington, Vermont. A bunch of uh, guys running the DEF CON here out there. Uh, we've had our space for about a year. We had a false start uh, two years ago. Found another space. Um, what's your experience been with your relationship with the greater community? Um, like we've recently been featured in the local newspaper along with a number of maker spaces and fab labs and things popping up all over. Um, what are the best practices in terms of like that relationship? How do you see that working? That's going to be dependent on a lot of your members, right? Uh, you know, for instance, if we do, we've done real good with Reddit groups and things like that because we've had people at the space who are Redditors, you know, so they've talked it up on, on Reddit a lot and we've gotten a lot of publicity through that. Um, we've done pretty good at one or two local universities. They've come in for lock picking night, you know, they post it on the boards about it and stuff like that. But um, that comes down to, I think, sometimes to you know, your, your local members and what they do and then them leveraging their own communities. If you've got a lot of young students, you'll get mad activity from you know from their 
student body and stuff. And g mm -hmm. great things like lock picking night is who doesn't want to learn how to pick a lock, right? I, I mean, everybody will come in for that, especially if they're you know kids in school. So um, the the more networking you can do, the better. Um, you know, Nick, you've had more experience than I. Have. I mean, the the again, it depends on the area, but the the three big things that. Uh, that I think always work really well. One, and just in, in order of simplicity, one, just writing press releases. There's a lot of lazy media out there that is looking for somebody to, have, to, to write articles for them. So write the article that you want to appear and just send it out to as many news organizations as you can. This works better in smaller areas where there are more small town newspapers and, or small town radio stations and things like that. Not, not so much in big cities. Um, the second thing is get excited about other hackerspaces projects. You know, post comments on their blog, their Facebook group, tweet at them. If you see other hackerspaces doing cool things, reach out to them so that when you have something cool about it, you can go to them and say, hey, you know, this project looks a lot like yours, or we were excited about your project, can you be excited about ours? I mean, and those sorts of things will just happen automatically. And of course, the third thing is reaching out to people at cons. You know, that, that's, that's simple enough. You're just walking through the hallway, you're going to hear a conversation of somebody who's hacking on something that you're hacking on. Feel free to butt into that conversation and say, oh, hey, I was doing this, or I was hacking this, or I solved this problem, or I, I have this problem that I'm running into. Do you have a possible solution for it? That, basically, those three, three big things. And, and in addition to press releases for number one, making friends with journalists anytime that there's, and uh, like writing letters to the editor if they're you know, talking about, ooh, bad, evil hackers doing bad, evil hackerish things, mm. reach out to them and write them like, no, we're good, I mean, not the, we're real hackers. And this is what real hacking is, that what you're writing about is not what hacking is about. That's a criminal element. And in any human activity, there's going to be a criminal or illicit element to it. Jumping on that, consistency too in the media stuff is a real big deal, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, if you're going to establish a blog or a Twitter presence, it, it really does come down to uh, consistency. You, you know, one of the best people at it I know of is Grex down at Nova. All right, he, is con he consistently blogs about local hacker events that are happening down in the Nova area, Northern Virginia. Um, and he, he blogs multiple times per week, he tweets multiple times per day in some instances. So there's a lot of mind share about Nova Hackers, because he's always putting information out there and sharing information. He also gives uh, shout outs to other hacker spaces and everything else. He's probably one of the better examples I've seen of someone who really knows how to talk about it and, and chat it up correctly and uh, do it in a very genuine way. And he's really consistent about it. Also, having a spot for other groups in your area to meet in your space mm -hmm. is a really, really good way to get the word out about your space. You know, if you can get the 2600 group to meet in, in your space. Or, the, or, or your lugs. You know, or your lugs. Your lugs oh, in yeah. your area or something yeah, like huge. that. Bring them in. Um, uh, bring them in. Because they're going to see that you've yep. got a cool space and you're, you're going to get people working on other projects outside of those meetings in your space as well. So community outreach, dude. Like, mm -hmm. you know, nothing gets the newspaper better than people that you thought were bad doing something good in the community. And, you know, that, that little dynamic, I don't know, is uh, newsworthy to a lot of uh, even the tech writers for your local paper. They'll want to get in on that. I mean, I don't know. Like, sometimes it's even non-technical. Uh, do a food drive. Go feed the hungry. I mean, you know, go hack your community. I mean, if you really want them to get, you know, your attention, that's make them your project. It's all on the table. So, yep. Great. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, cool. man. Thanks, man. So, what can you do about a neg uh, neutral, negative, or defunct hack space? I mean, especially when they're claiming that they are the official hack space of the area. Start a new one. There's no such yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, we, so you're talking about like you know spaces you, you, or groups break in, break or groups? Break into their hacker space and change their fucking locks. That's what you do. <laughs> all right? So those tedious bastards can't get back into their building. Shut them down. Um, start your own space. Honestly. Uh, you start your own spin-off space. Um, if, if you don't like the vibe at Hacker Space A, go and start Hacker Space B. Yeah, yeah. There, there is no special thing. I, I, I deal with this routinely. A group starts up in an area where there was a guy who wants to retain some sort of control over a group that really doesn't exist. Yep. And we always say first, you know, communicate with them, but if they're being an ass, um, start your own. I mean, nothing works better than success at getting rid of the, defuncts, the yep. defunct ones. You know, I mean, just one up them. <laughs> It's the best thing that I got for it. I mean, does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Huh? I mean, you want to build a better hacker space. 
Okay. You know, and then make a point of telling them that you're better than their hackers, best friend. Well, the problem is that they're going to the press and places like that. Sure. But, and well, it's put, putting a bad environment in the air. Fight fire with fire. Go to the press back. Or just hack. Yeah, say another one started up, and this is what we're doing. I mean, hack. I mean, you, know, and, you don't have to go head to head. There, there is no official no hacker space of anything. There, there's and if they go and, and that's the thing if they go to the press and say we're blah 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 if they don't eventually if they don't have anything to show for it they're going to look like the charlatans they are. Okay. And they should be probably let, let, killed by the rest. And, of and in the meantime, while they're right, and in the meantime, while they're making fools of themselves, come up with something cool. Yep. Yeah, more than likely they'll end up on like attrition yep. or somewhere like that, and things fall off quickly from there. Not, and they, a lot of those go away after a while too, don't they? Yeah. They fade off. They, they'll just burn out and die. Yeah. Eventually, anyway, it's been my experience is, is that you know they'll go away. Right. And you guys will still be there hacking it up. Mm-hmm. Cool. Dude, shot. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I'm gonna hit somebody hard. You're gonna hit those. somebody with those things, Dave. That's the goal. Yeah, yeah I know, right? it's, it's in the right zone, so I'm only gonna hit those two guys right there. So pedestrian. So, right. <laughs> I'm still me. picking my next seat very carefully around here. Uh, speak up. Sorry, uh, I used to be able to speak before last night. Um, when you started this conversation off, you had mentioned that you had gone to Germany to see what they did in their spaces. Can you tell us a little bit about? Uh, how they are different and it, maybe speaking in terms of maturity and how their groups have evolved, whether they're more stable, whether they're accomplishing more, that sort of thing? Um, in, as far as how they're different, what I, I'd Google for something called the hackerspace design patterns. That's, that's basically, that, that will illustrate um, in essence what they do and how they're different. And, and it's not to say that what's going on in Europe as a whole uh, it's not like a shiny, rosy, happy paradise. They're just seven or eight generations ahead of where we are. And th that's a real big deal. You know, I was, um, Nick and I were talking about this before, is I was in, um, the last time I was in Berlin, I went to Seabase for the first time. And, and, and they've been around for a while. Um, so they've, I don't want to say they have a roadmap, but it's a mature space. You know, it, it's a mature space with developed areas and an established set of members and people that go there. Um, so it, it's hard to say, you know, how they've gotten there with the exception of maturity over the years, but it's, it's a developed, dedicated area. But they're not all that much different template-wise, honestly, than unallocated or any of the other spaces I went to. They were different size-wise, but it was, it was the fact that they had mature, broad memberships. And, and I really think at the end of the day, it's the people at the space that make the space, right? Um, and, and that's probably what I would always default to, is, is the people will make a good space. So, so in a sense, what you're saying, there's a critical mass involved, that time has just allowed them, mm, pardon me, uh, critical mass, time has given them that, op that opportunity to grow and create the critical mass that maintains them. Yep. But thank you. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll also add to that that I think if you look at the growth patterns of hackerspaces in Europe and growth patterns of hackerspace in the US, we've grown much, much faster than anybody could have imagined, going from two or three yeah. places that you could call a hackerspace to hundreds in the space of really three years um, is, is something remarkable. And the fact that, it, I mean, two or three, def, two DEF CONs ago, uh, pe you know, a bunch of people were coming up to me and asking like, how do we start a hackerspace? How, no, how did blah, 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 blah. Nobody asks that question anymore because it's something that's been done hundreds of times. The, it, you can Google this answer very, very quickly. And that's something that um, we have a lot to thank the Germans for, for the design patterns. Um, and I think that we will get up to that level of maturity quickly. But right now we're sort of in the first kind of decline phase. Any, with anything that grows very rapidly, you'll see a little bit of a decline before you get the next big acceleration in growth. Thank you. Thanks, man. Hey, I'm Sai Tsai from Alpha One Labs. And um, we're kind of, uh, in the trap of like the leader with a vision type of space. And it's actually, it's worked out for us for three years in the way that we can maintain the space and keep it going and there's not too, too much fluctuation financially. However, I feel like um, the people want to um, be more of a bazaar and, and branch out and, and just be their own entities sort of and I was wondering uh, what would you suggest to uh, facilitate a, um, 
a, um, a safe moving out of a, that type of role into more of a, a widespread um, facilitating space. I mean, we've even had the problem of someone leaving our space and starting their own space as well. So we'd like to um, comment on that type of thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. I, I mean, pro projects fork. Hacker spaces fork. Forking's not, it, forking's generally a good thing. It doesn't always happen for the best of reasons. It usually happens because there's a personality conflict, but that's, that's good. There are now two hacker spaces where there are one, two communities where there used to be one. As far as, you know, what the leader should do, you know, and, and I've, there is, you know, it was a group of say two or three people who started hacker spaces and then were sort of nudged out or, or didn't feel comfortable or left for whatever reason. Um, and that group now, I mean, we could probably have a panel discussion of 20 people who have been edged out of their hacker spaces for whatever, or, or felt like they had to leave their hacker spaces. Um, in a lot of ways, if somebody, usually the people, the, the personality types that it takes to start a hacker space are very strong personality types just to get everybody going, to, to plow through all of the obstacles that it takes. And then usually when that person, you know, is no longer needed to be in that sort of leadership visionary role, the best thing for them to do to let the space grow and mature is usually just to step aside entirely. Yep. And not go off and start a new hacker space, but go and be a regular peon member of another hacker space and let the hacker space grow and mature in and of itself. You know, you're, you're, people fall in, people establish certain patterns at the beginning of any kind of a relationship and for whatever reason those patterns will persist. And until you feel that those patterns have been broken, um, it, it's usually a, better to just absent yourself. Cool. Thanks. Dude, thanks. John. Watch out. Ugh, incoming. All right, we, uh, we have what, maybe four minutes? Or two minutes. Yeah, I'm actually going to pack up and leave. Okay. I got go, to gotta go to another talk, so. Okay, I, uh, all right, five minutes. All right, next question. Yeah. I have a question for the, uh, for the newer you're, uh, you're, uh, You want to come to my talk, too. Let's go. I want to go to your talk. Go ahead, man. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about uh, growth, especially for the, the, the newer groups, uh, should they be taking more of a messianic approach of actually going out and trying to get members? Because the people that, that do want to be in a local, uh, they, they're, they're going to find the group. I mean, how, mu how much effort should really be put into growing the group? Well, all right. So, like, membership drives, if you will, kind of the, the things behind it. Uh, you can go out and um, we have a lot of people come to our group who drive for like an hour and a half because they really want to be part of something. Uh, but if you're in that lull phase, getting drives, um, just by putting your group out there, uh, mentioning where you're at, making it good public uh, awareness as to, hey, we're going to be on Tuesday at this place once a month or every week um, and make it something that isn't uh, that, that's openly accessible, you know, whether it be like, like our group plays trivia every Tuesday at a local bar. Uh, and that makes a real sort of easy entry. And other people in the room hear you, they see you, they see you as a cohesive unit, and they kind of gravitate towards you. Um, Let me add to that too, is look at non-hacker spaces, or non-hacker places or non-IT places, right? Um, I think one of the most important things to do is make hackers out of non-hackers, right? You take your non-hackers and turn them into hackers. To, to do that, you have to go to the places that the, the non-hackers are, right? So if you're looking to expand the base, it, it's a good thing to reach out to some of those areas where you wouldn't necessarily find hackers necessarily, but, but looking into those other communities. Schools are great places. Um, engineering universities are great places. Things like that. Reaching out to those kinds of pockets of people are good ways to bring in new blood because they think differently um, than we do and I, I think we become better hackers by bringing in broader sets of, uh, of talented people. I can add to that by saying um, what's, worse, what's worked for us uh, um, a lot is um, oh, word of mouth. Um, word of mouth has been great for us. Um, we've gotten Probably 50% of our membership that way. Um, uh, the other 50% usually find us on defcon.org, um, so that's an awesome resource. We've got one minute. Oh, and um, yeah, uh, <laughs> one minute, okay. Um, yeah, that's been awesome for us, and um, we hand out flyers, and we also have a 
area that all the groups in Milwaukee um, use, and for that, that has been great for us. As you know. Hate to cut you short, but I'm giving the signal that it's time. We do have a Q&A session directly across the hall in the Q&A room. Uh, if you have any questions you want to keep asked. But uh, sorry, I wanted to thank you all for coming out. Um, I hope to see you all soon um, around the conference. Just come by, say hi. Uh, have a great day. Cool. Yeah.